I wish I could say that Star Trek Picard Season 3, Episode 3 was only 17 seconds long, but unfortunately, it was a whole lot longer than that, and it was painful. This, in my opinion, was the worst episode so far of this season. I don't know if you agree with me or not, but I thought so. I don't know. Last episode, Episode 2, it made me laugh. I was enjoying watching the ridiculousness, so that was my favorite episode of the season, but probably not for the right reasons. So between this and episode one, I mean, at least episode one was like overpowering you with that member berry music, and this was just dragging stuff out, because I only have a slight positive things to say about this episode. I don't know, this had Michael Dorn in it though, so I don't know. To me, it's almost a tie with episode one, but I could see where you might see this is a worse episode. I thought it was worse. The lines coming out of the actors' mouths were terrible. If you look at who wrote this episode, and you go back and you look at Picard season two, you're going to see something that would tell you why this was terrible. Because you're going to see three episodes from season two written by the same person or duo who wrote this particular episode. So you cannot tell me that this is completely new and different when you have the same writers that wrote the same crap. If you hated season two, I cannot imagine why you would like this shit, because it was terrible. I mean, we start out with the Shrike chasing after the Titan. Of course, there's chaos inside the Titan, and one of the Starfleet people turns to Jack and says, this is your fault. Which, again, why are you taking the time to blame somebody when you are in the middle of a fight? I mean, seriously. And as that ship was being chased, the camera work had the Titan like spiraling around. It looked like a J.J. Abrams Star Trek 2009 type shot. In fact, there were several shots in this that looked like it was from J.J. 2009. And I'm not saying that as a compliment. Meanwhile, Picard is saying things like, she'll peck away at us until we surrender, which was a callback to all that weird-ass bird crap Vatic was talking in the previous episode, which I thought was absolutely stupid. <laughs> and meanwhile, Vatic is, is sitting there in her throne, smoking her cigar, laughing her girlish little laugh. I mean, it was, it was ridiculous. It was absolutely ridiculous. I have to say, this was one of the stupidest things I have ever seen. The dialogue in this episode was crap. This was terrible. And I'm sorry that there are people who think this was good. To each their own. I'm not going to ding you for that. But for me, this was... Not Star Trek. This was garbage. By stupid, I think Molly agrees with this. It wasn't the over-the-top ridiculousness of last week. This episode just had dialogue after dialogue of just stupid scenarios set up with... I was calling it as I was watching this. I was looking at Molly and going, this isn't even a telenovela because telenovelas can be fun because they're over the top. This was just some run-of-the-mill daytime soap opera where most of these scenes, only toward the end were they getting into anything that even felt remotely like a science fiction show. The stuff for three quarters of it was just people talking about their feelings and being angry at other people. And it was just all daytime soap opera stuff and not a very good daytime soap opera. Yeah, so anyway, the Titan's getting chased around and we have time to take a flashback. And we're flashing back to Riker and Picard sitting in Guinan's bar. And this is right after Riker's son was born. Riker is telling Picard this story about how he was called down to sick bay. Oh, eh, because apparently it was some sort of difficult birth or something. And it was the longest 17 seconds of his life to get down there. So that's where the title of this episode came from. And it was all about how he was fearing for his son's life. Was the Titan being attacked when his son was being born? I mean, is this like back to 2009 kind of J.J. Abrams crap? Because otherwise, why the hell wasn't Will Riker down there with Deanna while she was giving birth? That scene between those two, the topic itself about being a parent for the first time or, or just being a parent, period, the topic itself I wanted to give credit for, but the way that they were trying to push that theme onto Picard later about him being a father, and I don't know, maybe it's, I'm an old man and maybe it's just my own ages and I've got some self-hate, but when Kirk did this type of thing in the Wrath of Khan, he was in his 50s. So that's that midlife crisis time. That resonated with me as far as a turning point in somebody's life. That's why I identified more with Kirk doing that in his 50s. 
Patrick Stewart's, what, 77, 79? I don't know how old he actually is. But in the series, I think they said he was like 90, at least in season one. So having a supposed 90-some-year-old man trying to get excited about being a parent, it didn't work for me. I Maybe it's some ageism kicking out, but when a person's in their 90s, I think one's well past that. But... Maybe that's just me. I don't want to push my values on anybody else. But I had trouble. If those were two different characters, that scene would have worked much better than what it did for me. Yeah, because then Will says to Picard, I hope one day you get to have this feeling too. And then Deanna contacts Will and she's all angry because he's not there. He's out having cigars and drinks and she hasn't gotten to brush her hair in 72 hours. It was one of the most ridiculous things ever. And then she says... Don't forget to bring the scotch bottle or something like that. Yeah, ugh. So I won't talk about that one anymore, but that was terrible. So the flashback ends there, and then we go back to the present day. Everything on this bridge looks like discovery. The lighting and everything, the lens flares. It was just the action to the way things are getting thrown around. It just, it looked like Star Trek Discovery to me. I think the only thing that wasn't Discovery, I believe in Discovery, those are still the J.J. Abrams windows to the outside world, which to me don't make any sense. This one had like the static on the screen, like in the Wrath of Khan when they were in the nebula. And hey, they're in a nebula here and they're doing the same thing. Hey, that's consistency, or hey, that's lifting material. Considering what else they lift later on here that Molly will get into, I'm assuming they're just lifting it. However, at least it looked like the view screen was a view screen and not a window, so I'm going to give it some credit. But the rest of that bridge, I agree with you. There were partial lens flares coming in. The bridge looked like a remade Discovery Bridge. So then they're talking about how there's an electrical impulse from inside the nebula, and apparently there's a biological component to that, and I'll come back around to that at the end. That's when Shaw said, well, that's fun. Anybody else want to throw any weird shit at me? Molly's not taking that and putting it into some sort of funny phrase. That's pretty much what Shaw said. It was so on Star Trek. It was something you would expect on the Orville, not a serious Star Trek show. So then we cut to Seven and she's listening to what sounds like church music. Sydney LaForge shows up at Seven's quarters to give her a pep talk. And that was stupid. Forced, contrived, just came off as very superficial and self-serving. I didn't like that at all. There didn't really seem to be much depth to it. It was just more... Soap opera. Yeah. It was soap opera. Yeah, and she's talking about how her dad had trouble making friends. And I'm like, I don't remember Jordy having trouble making friends. I remember Jordy having trouble getting women, but not making friends with men. If Sidney LaForge's father had actually been Barkley, then I would have bought this. But this just seemed like they were changing the character again to suit what they needed for this episode to do. And it was just ridiculous. So then we see Beverly. She's doing her doctoring, trying to help people who are getting injured during this fight that's going on. The other doctor, the Trill doctor who's there, is quite nasty to her, telling her, you know, I don't have time to get you caught up on the last 20 years of medicine or some crap like that. was stupid. And so Picard goes and sees Beverly, and she's talking about how she knew their relationship was over, and he's like, oh, I didn't know our our whole relationship was over, just the romantic one, and it ended five times already, so whatever. And she got pregnant that very night, and she wanted to tell him, and she tried to tell him, but then he got kidnapped, and then she tried to tell him again, and there was an attempt on his life, and then she tried to tell him again, and there was another attempt on his life. So then she just gave up. She didn't give him an opportunity to make his own decisions at that point. And then she's invoking his father, and how he was so afraid of becoming his father if he became a father. It was just, it was... Just, ugh. I've seen better soap operas, and I've watched a lot of soap operas, and they've dealt with this stuff so much better. This dialogue between them felt like somebody made some fan fiction, and they said, Hey, remember that conversation between James Kirk and Carol Marcus in The Wrath of Khan? Let's add some extra layers to that, and let's go ahead and redo this. Because as I was watching this, this was essentially the conversation where Carol Marcus was saying, I wanted him to be part of my life, not yours. But in The Wrath of Khan, it was a very understated conversation. It lasted like, what, a minute maybe at most? Whereas this dragged on forever and it was going over the same ground again. And then she said something like, I knew I could protect my son, but I didn't know if I could protect your son. She sounded so selfish. It was terrible. And I find it hard to believe that she has a 20-year-old son. It just... (laughs) 
It would make more sense if this kid was a clone of her first husband, because this just seems so unbelievable. Just it takes you right out of that suspension of disbelief that you need to be able to buy a story like this. And uh, as I said, I've seen better soap operas. The thing is, maybe with medical technology of that era, I could see how an older woman could have a child. But the problem was, through the rest of this episode, somehow they've reverted back in medicine. Because as they were treating people, it looked like they were using older techniques than we saw in The Next Generation. The next thing that got me is this whole conversation between Crusher and Picard. She was making it sound like all Picard did through his entire life was make enemies. I don't remember that. Maybe in the movies, if you want to call out the movies. But in The Next Generation, Picard, I always took as a diplomat. He was somebody who came in to try to fix a problem, to bring ethics into a problem. So I don't know why Dr. Crusher was setting him up. Well, apparently Picard has this long history of making enemies. And so eventually with somebody who makes all these enemies, they're eventually going to come after his family. I didn't understand that. I had no idea of what she was talking about. But I this point i didn't care i don't know maybe picard after the movies or during it and then after he just made a bunch of enemies like all he was doing was screwing people over and making enemies left and right that's what dr crusher seemed to think yeah (laughs) so then we see Riker and jack and Riker's trying to tell jack oh he's the finest man i know and speaking of picard jack said something about him being positronic (laughs) and then Riker said well he's the same man and you know what that would have been an interesting episode in and of itself, but nope, they just leave it at that. And I'm waiting for that episode. I've said this in a couple of videos. I'm waiting for the episode of how do you know Picard is the same person? He's a robot now. You're acknowledging he's a robot. This is the last week there was that line about in your artificial skin. Mm-hmm. And this week was about, oh, he's positronic now. That Will Riker acknowledged as true. And then he just asserts, but he's the same man. How do you know that? Even after he was assimilated by the Borg in the TV series, there was questions about whether he was the same man. I don't understand the Borg stuff questioned whether he was the same person. And he was still in the same body. He just had implants added to him. Even being in a robot body, what does that mean? Did they put his brain inside this robot? Or did they just take a snapshot of his engrams and just replace them in this? I believe that's what happened. So... If that's the case, is this really the same Picard? I wish they would explore that. I've been saying this all season. And they just throw a line away about that. It's like, no, that is Star Trek. Why don't you spend an episode, instead of hanging out in a nebula, redoing the Wrath of Khan, why don't you spend an episode exploring if Jean-Luc Picard is still Jean-Luc Picard? Yeah, because this reminds me of... And I know some people didn't really care for this film, but I did. Johnny Mnemonic, the cyberpunk movement from back when we were younger, talking about people putting imprints of their personalities into, well, a computer. I guess we'll just be simple that way. I mean, in one of the lines in the film, the person who had done this, it was a woman, and she is referred to as a ghost in the machine. That's the way I look at Picard. Just because there's an imprint of his personality in this robot, that's not him. That's a ghost in the machine. I really wish that they would talk about that and stop treating him like this is still Jean-Luc Picard because it's not. Jean-Luc Picard died in that first season. They're walking around with this robot. They're not even mourning As bad as in Generations, some people had problems with Captain Kirk dying on that planet and just having a bunch of rocks stuck on top of him, and that was his burial. That was the big remembrance of Captain Kirk. Jean-Luc Picard died in season one, fighting those space flowers, and nobody's mourning his death. I wish they would either ignore it completely and just say, look, that was a stupid idea, we're not even touching it. Or if you're going to bring it up, and they brought it up twice already, deal with it. Talk about it. There's a lot of stories to be told here. Yeah, and then I don't remember. Maybe you remember who said this. People have a right to know who or what they're putting their lives on the line for when 
people were giving Jack the cold shoulder some more. Was it Riker who said that to Jack? It might be. I don't remember. Because that was one of the stupidest things I've ever heard. It's not like you sign up for Starfleet and then you're on a starship. Well, you get to decide battle by battle whether or not you want to participate because, you know, you get to choose what you want to put your life on the line for. It's like, no, you're there to follow orders. You already decided that you're there to put your life on the line for the mission of whatever Starfleet tells you you're going to do. You're there to defend the Federation. When you're a soldier, you don't get to just pick and choose. You signed up, you do what you're told. <laughs> I mean, uh, unless... The captain is there committing war crimes, in which case you should be like, nah, dude, nah, I'm not doing that. You shoot me first. I'm not doing that. That's, that's, <laughs> seriously. But this was ridiculous. We saw why you shouldn't do that. Because at the beginning of this episode, there was that line about this is all your fault that guy in sickbay to Jack Crush. Now all that's doing is causing efficiency problems with the ship. This next point is probably a nitpick. And this is more of my ignorance than like the logical problem with the episode. But during that conversation, there were, and this happened throughout the episode, on the Titan, there's like these blue conduits that are in the background. What are those? Because I was talking to Molly, I was expecting Darwin the Dolphin to be swimming through those, if anybody remembers Sequest, and they made those tubes, Bridger designed the ship so a dolphin could swim through the whole ship. And what are those blue conduits? I don't know. I'm not saying there's a logical issue there. I'm just saying I don't know what those are. They were throughout the ship. It was odd to me if somebody could explain, because I know Star Trek Online, they've designed a lot of ships there. Maybe they've explained this. I don't play Star Trek Online. So if somebody could share what those blue conduits are, I'd appreciate it. So then they established further that Riker's son is dead when Riker says, I had a son to Jack. And so then we go back to Beverly and Picard. She's talking about how people keep trying to take Jack, different people every time, just like Jack said in a previous episode. She's blaming this on Jean-Luc Picard, that somehow this is his fault, that all these warships with his enemies keep showing up to try to take her son. Apparently, all Picard did through his entire career was make enemies. That's what he's known for. If you watch Next Generation and you thought Picard's legacy was the great diplomat and speechmaker, you're wrong. John Luke Picard's big legacy is he made enemies wherever he went. Just remember that. Just like Jordy LaForge couldn't make friends. Remember those things because that's what those characters are now. So then she tells him that when Jack was old enough, she did tell him who his father was. And Jack's the one who decided not to reach out to his father. <laughs> did they ever explain why this kid is named Jack? Is that just something he picked? No, we Because don't know. it seems weird that this is her second husband's... Were they married? I don't remember if Picard and Crusher were married, but it seems weird that this is Picard's kid biologically, but she named it after her husband, her Jack. That's just, to me, that's weird, but maybe they haven't explained. Maybe the kid, because he has so many aliases, maybe he chose his own name. I don't know, but that just seems weird. If she gave him that name and that's Picard's kid and she knew that was Picard's kid, that just seems weird to me. But Yeah, that's messed up. That's really messed up. Yeah, so... Uh, Picard tells Riker that, you know, he's not going to try to talk to his son. And Riker's like, ah, oh, you never know when it'll be the last time, so you should make an effort. And, you know, because his own son's dead. And Picard is like, oh, no, it's irreparable. These characters are behaving so extreme and over the top as far as oh, <laughs> the drama the drama 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 i'm so tired of this because it's not even done well as i said i've watched a lot of soap operas in my day i watched a soap opera where the same character did to two different guys what dr crusher allegedly did to Jean-Luc Picard. She had two sons, one with one mobster, one with another mobster, and hid both sons. It was done better both times and <laughs> This is just garbage. I have never seen such crap writing that people thought, well, actually, no, I take that back. I've seen a lot of crap writing lately that people think is fantastic. But you know what? To each their own, I guess. But I'm not going to sit there and say this is great when it's clearly not. There are zero laughs in this episode. So unlike last week where we were enjoying it because it was funny, this is just a grim, it's shot dark. It's just all grim topics. There's nothing here 
to grab onto if you want anything optimistic. You're not going to get it in this episode. It was as dark as dark gets, just like all of Kurtzman Trek. Just dark as dark can get. Yeah, so apparently they've been hiding in the nebula this whole time. But then the Shrike found them and shoots at them. And Shaw is injured. Again, it looked just like the crap you would get from Star Trek Discovery. And so then Shaw... He's bleeding all over the place, and he points to Riker and said, It's your fault! You got us into this! You're going to get us out! And he transfers command to Riker, which again, it's like, who is this written for? Is this written for middle schoolers? Because that seems to be the level of conversation in this show. It makes no sense for the most part, and the characters just behave like over-emotional teenagers. It's just terrible. Then- People like Shaw. And I don't understand. Nothing against the actor. I don't know him personally. But this character, Shaw, this is somebody who never would have passed the test needed to become a starship captain. Like, at all. This is like a teenage boy in a man's body that was given control of a starship. And I do not understand at all why people like this guy. He represents the worst of Starfleet. At least he's not a mass murderer like Michael Burnham. But... He's a nothing. This guy is nothing. So then Picard is Riker's number one, and they fire a torpedo in the vicinity of the Shrike, and then they hit the torpedo with a phaser, and apparently that knocks the Shrike around. I don't know. I don't even know what the hell they were trying to do there. Whatever. So then Rafi wakes up, and it's like, we are a good portion into this episode by this point. And then we switch to Rafi, which just made the pacing seem all weird. And that told me what the A story, B story, C story, D story was. That on the Titan, they had several A story, B story, C story, D stories going on. Then Rafi was like E or F. Uh, to have her show up at that point in the episode was really weird. Really, really weird. God, and it was just more over-the-top stuff. I mean, you see Worf practicing what looks like martial arts moves, and he's listening to opera. It just came across like so pretentious. He easily disarms Rafi when she tries to come up and, hey, hey, who are you? Where am I? Yada, yada, yada. And he rattles off his title and all his names and then offers her chamomile tea. And then she's like, oh, you're a legend. And it just... Oh, God. The thing that I noticed in the exchange between Michael Dorn and the Rafi character is, this is the same criticism I made in that Strange New World episode where they redid Balance of Terror, and my criticism was when Ethan Peck was delivering his lines, and I compared that to Leonard Nimoy issuing the same lines. Leonard Nimoy had a certain, a slower cadence that allowed people to soak in what he was saying, and Ethan Peck was like running through the lines as quickly as he could. Rafi acting against Michael Dorn, because for me, Michael Dorn was like the highlight of this episode. You could tell in his voice he was older because he didn't quite have that same super powerful wharf voice, but he still was pretty good as far as his voice. And when he was in a dialogue with Rafi, so he was saying something and then she was like quick quipping back and then he was saying something again. It became obvious the difference of their acting ability. That's the thing that struck me was Michael Dorn still had the ability to act. I wish that he had better lines to say than what he was given, but Michael Dorn, he could still act. The actress playing Rafi, she cannot act. She just can't. I don't know why they keep putting her in this. Because if I was going to pick a character to build up a little bit of the new characters, Ensign LaFord, she's actually not too bad. I wish they'd give her more lines, better lines, but more lines. But Rafi and Michael Dorn, when they were Worf, when they were talking, that was some cringy stuff when Rafi was talking. I did want to hear Michael Dorn because just hearing him talk was nice. I don't know. Maybe that's the member berries were working on me. But Michael Dorn talking was nice. But then Rafi ruined it. So it's like, well, there goes that. Yeah, his head ridges didn't look right to me, but I'm not going to nitpick about that. For me, the best part of this whole episode was the flashback when Rafi was remembering what happened at Sneed's because she's remembering, well, when Sneed was stabbed and he goes, ah! That was hilarious. Okay, there was one point here that was funny. You're right. That was funny. Because we both funny. laughed when they showed that flashback, and he's like, ah! That was her memory. <laughs> ah! Oh my god. 
<laughs> so that was like the one highlight of this whole episode, which lasted probably like 10 seconds, but uh So then we're back to, you're my handler? And then Worf saying, oh, there's something coming. You have the heart of a warrior and the instincts of a warrior and just all this, this crap. It was this exposition and it was just a lot of tell and not a lot of showing. She doesn't have any of those things. And no. Just the character Rafi has none of those things he was putting on her. Yeah, so then apparently he already knows who paid the Ferengi to lie. So I guess that's why it was okay for him to just go in there and clean house at Sneed's place. Titus Ricca, apparently he's a human. So they're going to go look for this guy and bring him in and, and question him. So, okay, whatever. And during this, when they were talking, Rafi was having withdrawal symptoms from her little drug escapade with the, what was it called, splinter? Yeah. The crap they stuck in her eye. Mm -hmm. It had one quick payoff later in the episode, but it wasn't anything of any consequence. It was just stupid. I, I, stupid. They, they were trying... Again, having a withdrawal from a drug could be much like the Picard positronic. That could be a good topic, but not if you're not going to explore it in any useful way. I, it shouldn't last like a few minutes and that's it. It was just a minor part of the whole episode. It was just ridiculous. She wasn't even taking anything to compensate for it. She just kind of, she had the, the shakes for a, a scene, basically. And then it was all done. Well, she's gone through withdrawal before, you know, so. She toughed it out. Yeah, yeah. They did it better on Andr Andromeda. Yeah, when they tried to dry Becca out from her uh, flash. Yeah. This just didn't need to be in there. They didn't do anything useful. There was one line later on in the episode where it kind of referenced that because they thought somebody was having withdrawal symptoms and they weren't. That was the only payoff here and it was stupid. They just didn't need that whole subject at all about her being re-addicted to this stuff. So then we're back to the Titan and we see Beverly and Jack doing some doctoring down in sick bay, all the people getting injured. That's when Beverly has the opportunity to show up that nasty Trill Doctor. I guess Shaw, he's really uncomfortable and, and the Trill Doctor is losing him. Beverly is feeling up Shaw and, and she's like, oh, this man is bleeding internally. And the, the Trill Doctor is like, oh, that's not what the machine showed. And Beverly's like, oh, well, this takes a while for it to show up. Oh, it was so dumb. So giving her the opportunity to show that doctor, the younger doctor, that her old lady medicine still works. Meanwhile, Shaw whispers to Jack, how does she keep finding us? And there's blood like all over the floor. And I guess that was supposed to be like the blood trail thing, blood in the water. But again, this is like, what? What? what why? <laughs> when did they ever start showing blood all over the place in Star Trek? I just assumed that medicine, even in the next generation days, that the first thing they would do is give you some sort of coagulant to cause the bleeding to stop. Yes, TNG was on mainstream television, so I can see why they didn't want to show all that massive blood. But I just assumed their medicine had stopped the bleeding. That's the first thing you want to do. And this is supposed to be further in the future than that. So then having blood all over, I mean, some people would say, well, that's just how wars are. Yeah, I guess in the 20th and 21st century, that's how wars are. But I just assume they'd have better medicine in this era, which I'm wrong, by the way. I don't know what they were doing other than they wanted to set up that metaphor for, oh, and later Jack's going to figure something out. And much like I said about Raffi and her withdrawal symptoms, where it had like one sort of payoff, it seems like that's all that was for was just that scene seeing the blood on the floor of sick bay was just for that yeah because isn't anybody cleaning that blood up i mean that's a hazard especially if you're trying to move wounded in there quickly you don't want to be slipping on the floor so just having that on the floor like that was ridiculous even now that would be stupid they weren't in such a bad situation I and mean, if that doctor is telling beverly that she can go do something else then beverly had enough time to clean the blood up off the floor and about a half dozen other people did too so anyway so jack tries to get to the bridge to try to warn them that the whole blood on the water thing, how that the Shrike is tracking them somehow. So that was like the one intelligent thing that Shaw has done on this whole season so far. But Jack gets to the bridge, and as I said, there's somebody stationed outside the door and won't let him in. I mean, that was stupid. So he goes to Seven instead, and of course there's somebody standing outside of her quarters. They let him in, but then when Seven and Jack were trying to leave, the security guy wasn't going to let them leave. And this security guy, just to make this clear, I'm assuming security personnel have a lot of training in hand-to-hand -hand combat. I just want to make this very clear. This guy was like twice the size of Jack Crusher. 
So please continue. Yes. So Jack punches him in the face and knocks him out and Seven... One punch. Yeah, says to him, oh, you're insane. And meanwhile, the doors are opening and closing because they keep hitting this guy in the legs. And they just leave him there laying on the floor. And it's like, wouldn't the intelligent thing to do would be to drag him into Seven's quarters and let the doors shut so that he's hidden? Instead of leaving him lying there in the hallway, that was dumb. It was a cool scene. Oh, God. And to give credit here, when Jack was talking to Seven and Seven was going into some techno babble about what could be happening, that was the only moment, not only in this episode, but possibly this whole series, that even remotely felt like Star Trek. Yeah, because they were talking about the science behind how the Shrike was tracking them. That they, the, the whole blood in the water concept, that they must be leaking something or giving off some sort of signal allowing the Shrike to find them. They figure it out that apparently there's some sort of leak. So they're going to find the leak and that's why they had to get out of Seven's quarters and they had to knock that guy out to get away. Meanwhile, the Shrike has found them again. They fire this weapon that opens up this portal. The Titan goes in, they come back out, and they're, like, even deeper into the nebula than they were before. It's the portal video game. If you played the portal video game, you know where you set up, you shoot the one portal in, and then you shoot the other portal, and then you can go between those two portals. That's what this is, except the way that the visual artists who made the CG of this, the way they illustrated it, it just, it was a slow process and it just looks stupid. Yep. Yeah. So Picard is telling Riker, now is the time to fight. And Riker is like, nope, and goes back into the nebula. So then we're back on Metallus Prime and Worf and Rafi get their man. And so they're interrogating this dude and they're doing good cop, bad cop. Rafi is the bad cop, threatening things like pulling out his fingernails. She thinks he's going through withdrawal. Well, as it turns out, It's not withdrawal. He needs to get in a bucket and regenerate because he is a changeling. So the founders are back, you know, like no shit, Sherlock, seriously. And (laughs) so apparently he's part of a rogue group of changelings who, after the Dominion War, refused to accept that it was over and they want to kill all the humans, I guess. So that was stupid. And They're, They're starting to mine, strip mine, Deep Space Nine, just... So we're aware, the viewer's aware, they have now come for Deep Space Nine. Now, I'm going to say that I thought the Changeling story at the very end, that actually got me a little interested. But then I turned to Molly and said, why couldn't they have had this concept in a different story? Because they're going to tell the story of the Changelings here in this ridiculous Star Trek Season 3 Picard. They're going to waste this story. It really makes me cringe on what they're going to do. They've come for Deep Space Nine. Because that was the only one that was safe. They touched Voyager with Seven. They went after TNG. Deep Space Nine was kind of safe. And now they're coming after Deep Space Nine. Wow, I go, okay. I guess all those people who love Deep Space Nine and they love the Dominion War and they love the Changelings, maybe that's why they like this. Maybe that's why they're saying this is good Star Trek because they think Deep Space Nine is the best of the Star Trek iterations. Maybe that's true. Maybe that's not. I disagree, but I know lots of people agree with that. So the fact that this is going so war heavy and now you've got Changelings, I think that's why a lot of people are liking this. It's they're reliving the Dominion War and they're remembering the good old days, the viewers who are watching this. That's where this is going. Eventually, this changeling, they revert back to being liquid form, and they're slinking along the floor. Worf fries him with a phaser, so that's the end of that guy. So, anyway, so Jack and Seven go looking for the leaking... There was something that was leaking. It turned out it was like some valve, like an old submarine-type valve or something. Valve system, yeah. Yeah, it looked like a submarine. And it was weird, because it looked like it was in, like, some sort of little room off of a hallway, and it just, is this engineering? What the hell am I looking at here? I don't know. But anyway, so they go, and they find that this has actually been sabotaged. Somebody hit it with phaser fire. Jack and Seven are separated, going around to, I guess there are different rooms of this crap. I don't know. So Jack is trying to repair what he's supposed to be repairing. He's alone in this room. And what looks like a Starfleet person, a member of Starfleet personnel comes in. They attack Jack and their face kind of does some sort of weird movement. Like, you a, know, like a morph or something. Yeah, leading you to understand, yep, it's another changeling. They have a saboteur on board. It's a changeling. And so the changeling uh, 
takes Jack's little gas mask away from him and leaves him lying on the floor. Seven has to go in to save him. Then we're, we're back to Riker and Picard. The trying to run and hide strategy of Riker's isn't working. <laughs> so Picard tells him that they have to fight and he, he tells Riker that he has to stop being so fearful of loss. And that this whole episode has just been talking about Riker losing his son and that's why he's so afraid to be a proper star fleet captain again. I mean, it was just, you know, they, they amped up the drama and wrote all this crap just to, I guess, try to make you feel things, give you all the feels. But it just seems really over the top and written for idiots. I miss the old way that they used to write Star Trek. There was no philosophy explored in this episode. And the periphery of philosophy, but no exploration of it. No, no. Like they would mention things. And I guess that tricks some people into thinking that more depth was there than really was. But they don't actually explore these topics at all. Whereas you used to like, I mean, just think of measure of a man, how they really discussed is Data a sentient being of his own with his own autonomy? Should he be? Or is he just a machine that they should be able to take apart and study uh, whether Data likes it or not. That was an interesting conversation to have. This, where is the conversation? There is no conversation here. There's nothing to think about. We've had three episodes of this improved season three. How many of the episodes did not have any violence in it? None. It's a, it's a round number. Yeah, yeah it's, zero. A, it's a big zero. Every episode is just violence, more violence, more violence. So anyway, so Jack obviously was injured by this idiot who took his gas mask off and left him there in that room. So I guess Seven gets him to sick bay. They're losing Jack and, and Picard goes running down there because he might be losing his son. But of course, they shock Jack's heart like a zillion times and finally he breathes. I laugh when that was happening. I said, Molly, just wait. After they think he's dead, he's going to cough and come back to life because that is such a tropey thing to do. And it's exactly what he what happened. It would have meant more if Jack would have died. I actually would have been like, okay, that was a significant story. Nope. Nope. The old, oh, at the last moment, that last little jolt they gave him brought him back to life. He coughed a little bit. And he's fine. Yeah, so now they know that there's a changeling saboteur on board. Rafi and Worf figure out from the changeling that they had that the destruction of the Starfleet recruiting building was just a distraction from whatever they actually stole from the Daystrom Institute. No idea. Ugh. So anyway... <laughs> So then on board the Titan, there's an explosion from the saboteur. They lose warp capability. So then they really have no choice but try to fight the Shrike. They have waited so long that by the time they are in position, because the Shrike doesn't know where they are anymore because they fixed their blood in the water problem, but apparently they gave them long enough to figure it out, especially after that explosion, that the Shrike is ready for them and just opens up a portal. The idiots fire into it and they end up shooting themselves and knocking out their own engines. So the Titan is now dead in the water. And it's falling toward several times in this episode. They said there's something at the bottom of the nebula. It's some gravity It's a gravity well. well. Mm -hmm. Like, a well, like in a water well, so they're falling down into this well in this nebula. That's At least that's how they're depicting it. Like it's a submarine that's going down into the trenches. Yeah, because it was weird because they kept opening up these portals and it's like, why do you keep flying into the portal? Hard to starboard so that you could get around the thing or up or down? I mean, this is space. You can pretty much move whatever way you want, provided you know how to handle your ship. There was this one scene where the penguin opened up a portal and it took a while to open up because this the, again, the visualization of this is I don't see how this is a weapon you can use how she's using it. The Titan was making this turn and then the portal was opened in front of them. There was so much time to deviate their course but they purposely flew right into the portal. Like, why didn't you turn? <laughs> they had several seconds to deviate their cars. <laughs> well, or, you know, how about Rikers say, hard to starboard? I mean, seriously? <sighs> so so they're sinking in this gravity well, and, and Riker actually says to Picard to remove himself from the bridge because he's just killed us all. And it was worse because he's like, remove yourself from the bridge, you've just killed us all. And Riker said this in front of all of the bridge crew. 
that was just the most unprofessional thing I have ever seen, I think. These two are supposed to be friends, too. Yeah, and, and <laughs> again, when you're in charge, you cannot show that kind of weakness. He just basically told everybody, well, we're just going to die. Sorry. I understand that they're going to set Picard up to have a what they call a redemption arc, but they didn't need to do this. This was... <laughs> Set up stupidly. Picard at this moment was debased just like in season one when he was doing the apology tour. Mm -hmm. I don't know why they were setting him up as this vicious fight first person. I don't understand. I'm not a great fan of first contact, but at least because it was the Borg and he had a trauma with the Borg that was blinding his judgment. Okay, that makes some sense in the first contact situation. I'm talking the film. In this case, there's nothing there to tie it back to some trauma. So why is Picard? I mean, we already know he makes enemies left and right. Dr. Crusher said that earlier. So why is Picard fight first? I don't understand that. I would have expected Riker to be the fight first person. Because story. Because this was written poorly. And uh, here's my prediction. Okay, so, so they're picking up biological signs in this nebula. So this thing is either going to throw them up or shit them out. And I'm I'm voting for shit because that's what this episode was. That's what this whole season has been. Of course, Vatic has spent all this time trying to take Jack alive. It doesn't make sense that she would leave him to die in the gravity well. Either she uses the portal technology to get them out, or she knows the nebula will expel them. Although, why didn't the saboteur disable the shields so he and Jack could just be transported off the Titan? This story makes no sense whatsoever. I don't understand why people think this is an improvement. This is the same crap we got in the previous seasons. This writer or duo of writers wrote for season two as well. Three episodes for season two. With these short seasons, I mean, that's the pretty good chunk of the crap we had in season two. This was just dumb. I have been trying to not... In our comments, we've been getting a lot of people asking, what is up with these bigger YouTube channels saying they got the advanced screening and they say this is good? I've been staying away from it or saying, well, we don't know yet. You know, maybe there's a twist coming, the holodeck theory that I've been proposing. We don't know what's going to happen here yet. But all I'm saying right now is this twist better happen soon because I'm starting to agree with our commenters in what were these YouTubers seeing, these large YouTube channels, because I've seen three episodes of garbage. Yes, this episode, there were a few things I can pick out that were actually, to me anyway, I think Molly is not quite on board the same way I am, but I can pick out and say there were some things here that I could see value in. But the majority of the episode was garbage. Then there were people online praising this. This is a bad fan film. It's not even a good fan film. This is a bad fan film. Normally when you have bad fan films, what happens is... The person making it liked one or two aspects, very narrow aspects of the franchise. And then they make a fan film based around that one or two things. And that's it. That's what this feels like. Somebody liked War, Wrath of Khan, Deep Space Nine, fighting, fighting, fighting. And then they liked some sort of relationship between Picard and Beverly Crusher. That they're exploring using the Carol Marcus and Captain Kirk, or Admiral Kirk at that point, metaphor. I don't understand. I do not understand what they're doing. I am starting now to officially question what these people were seeing. Because there better be a big twist coming up. This better be something leading up to, oh, Moriarty's coming and this is all a holodeck. No wonder it's so absurd. Because anything short of that, and I'm going to question the credibility of some of these larger channels. I'm not trying to pick a fight or an itty bitty channel. I'm just reflecting what our commenters are saying. What did you see? I'm hoping it's coming up soon. We're at episode three. If this gets better, why didn't you say... Hey, it starts rough at the beginning, but it gets better. Stick with it. Nobody said that. They said it was good from the get-go. Yeah. I think one of them said, you'll know in the first 40 minutes if this is actually something for you. Well, in the first 40 minutes, I learned to hate this thing. I'm trying to be optimistic. There are even people in the comments that are accusing Molly and I of being this hater setup. We don't want to hate this show. 
We really do not want to hate this. We are old school Star Trek fans. We've watched all the iterations. We've liked a lot of the iterations of them. So why can't they give us something to work with here? Just something. It's not hate when you can point to examples of what you're talking about to back up your criticism. That's not hate. That's pointing out the flaws and saying, I don't like this because of this, 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 and this. When you come along and say, well, you're just a hater. You're not going to change my mind by doing that. You're just being a jackass. So if you do like this, explain to me exactly why you like it. What is it about this that you like? Talk about scenes that you like. Talk about character development that you like. Talk about philosophy that you like. Talk about the aspects that cause you to say this is good. Because just saying, well, I like it, or you're a hater, you're not backing up your assertion. We're here to have a conversation. And if you're not going to have a conversation, then I don't even understand why you're coming here. If you have an argument to make, then make it. Otherwise, I have no time for you. You're an idiot. Well, that's why in some of the comments, normally if somebody talks and they're being an honest actor, we'll engage with them, even if we don't agree with them, but we'll engage because we enjoy having conversation. But you get these people that are driving by. They don't even watch the video. They go by the title. And they just start just getting insults in. And it's not like it hurts our feelings or anything. But then we reply back. It's usually me because Molly's Molly's a nice-ish person. <laughs> I'm a little bit more of a jerk when it comes to dealing with jerks. I reply back in a bit of a snarky way because if you're not going to take the conversation seriously, why should I? That's the part we're at right now is I'm looking at this, what they're doing in season three, and I'm having major questions. What is going on? We were told by so many outlets this is a big change from what happened in season one and two. Other than having more of the Next Generation cast, I'm not seeing it. This is definitely a continuation of season two. Definitely. Now, how is this different from season two? The people who say that it's different, please tell me how this is different because I don't see the difference. I see more of the same. So if you see something else, you need to articulate what that is because otherwise I don't see it and I'm never going to unless you figure out how to use your words to explain to me why you think this is different. Other than, and maybe it's as simple as, look, I just want to see Michael Dorn and Jonathan Frakes again. Then just say that. They could be reading the ingredients off of laundry detergent and you would want to see them doing that. Just If you just say that, we'll go, okay, then this is fulfilling what you want. We see why you like this. They're on screen and they're reading live. Yeah, fair enough. If that's what you like, then that's fine. I'm not going to criticize you for that. But don't pretend like that's good and everybody else should like it too. Because we all like things that are bad. We all do. I made the old man watch A Knight's Tale. If anybody's ever seen A Knight's Tale, well, you probably really liked it or you really hated it. I did not like it. He hated it. I'm one of those people who, yeah, I know it's a big piece of crap, but I enjoy watching it every so often because apparently I sometimes like crap. There's something about that crap that just trips my trigger. I enjoy it. And, you know, I can deal with the flaws and be like, yeah, it sucks but I still like it. And that's okay. If you like something, it doesn't have to be good. It doesn't have to be perfect. Other people don't have to say that's good and perfect. It's okay to like things that other people don't like. Wondrous variety, that's what makes humanity so much fun, is that we don't all like the same things. We don't see things the same way. I'm not gonna like bully somebody because they don't see things the same way that I do. But at the very least, have the respect to tell me what it is you like about it instead of just trying to bully me into shutting my mouth. That's where we are right now. Three episodes in, and this series has shown zero improvement. And all I can say is this twist that I'm speculating is going to happen, because I still think those bigger channels are bigger for a reason. And I'm saying that as a positive thing. They really must know what they're talking about. So if they're saying this is going to be good then I'm waiting for a twist because only a twist could explain how this is good. This is not good. It's not even like this is neutral, like this is meh. This is three episodes of very bad television. And I don't see the difference between these three episodes and the rest of what came before in Picard other than we have next generation actors. We have Gates McFadden. We have Michael Dorn. We have Jonathan Frakes, which was he was in season one. Marina Sirtis, who was in season one, 
And soon we're going to get LeVar Burton. Brent Spiner is going to be lore, I guess. Although, honestly... Might I'm, be B4 or just somebody else altogether. I mean, Who I'm, knows? I'm getting to a point now where... Patrick Stewart and Brent Spiner, if they just disappeared from this series and they just had the other characters, I would probably be okay with that. Because I'm, how many more iterations of Soong and a robot is Brent Spiner going to play? But apparently there's room for more and more and more. This is so frustrating. We went into this episode because we heard from people online, some medium-sized channels, not the bigger ones anymore, saying this was a marked improvement over what came the first two episodes. So we thought we were going to watch this and see a decent improvement. We didn't. There was stupidity galore going on, and not even the fun kind. I think Molly reminded me that that flashback of Raffi when she was rescued, her flashback started with that Ferengi yelling. <laughs> it was almost like a, what do they call it, a Wilhelm yell? That's that stock yell that they use in all those Hollywood movies in the oldie days. Actually, even probably recently. That's what that was like. <laughs> and I just This is Star Trek now. Star Trek is only about shooting. Now, Star Trek always had shooting, but there was so much more to it than just shooting. It's just about shooting now. It's about all this over drama about family and not good family. I mean, the family missing kids and all this other stuff you would see in soap operas. It's lit darkly, so there's nothing even visually pleasing to the eyes, the dialogue coming out insults my intelligence. I don't understand this. Like, this is Star Trek now. And this is J.J. Trek. This is Kurtzman Trek. This is no different than that. When am I going to get something? How about one episode where violence doesn't happen? How about that? The people who like this, give me one episode where no violence happens. If you do that... I'll at least acknowledge they at least stopped violence for one episode. Give me that. Yeah, I hated this episode. So, what did you guys think? Is there anybody out there who can actually articulate a defense for this episode? Because I would really like to hear why you think this was good. Those of you who agree with us and thought this was one of the worst things you've ever seen, feel free to commiserate with us in the comments. If you noticed anything else that was ridiculous that we didn't talk about, definitely bring that up in the comments so that we can discuss it there. Obviously, this video has gotten a bit long here, so we're just going to have to stop soon. But just tell us what you guys thought. Let's talk about this, because I don't understand why so many people are saying this was good, because to me, this was just terrible. I would rather watch fan films than this. There's some really good fan films out there, and I would rather watch the good fan films than watch this. Take care.